Hey everybody, it's Domi and Jamie with Hometown History tonight, and we're here for Hometown History. Jamie and Domi tell these York County history books as must-reads. We are at the Redland Library up here in Edders. Uh, we are back in Domi and I's neck of the woods. We both yep. live right down the road. And mm -hmm. Domi, you spent some time here. You volunteered here. I used to work here. I volunteered here uh, through high school. I think I started when I was 16, 17. So you're nice at home. Yeah, I am. Yep. <laughs> Practically lived here. <laughs> Tonight's agenda is we're going to take you through six books. Uh, we'll give you some background. And these books range from anywhere from historical nonfiction to academically published books at Yale University. Dami and I will go through our kind of main bar, which will take about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll take a small break, and then Silas Chamberlain will be on later because he is an author himself, and he'll be able to talk about one of his books. Oh, and by the way, we also, we couldn't just talk about six books. So after the six books, we're going to have a lightning round with like an extra six books, so we had to sneak it in there, but we promise we'll go fast. And there's still going to be books that you probably love that we're going to miss, but put them in the comment section so people know about them. Um, but just like any other episode, we want to tell you our takeaways. So if you're hunting for your next read, look no further than York County. We have tons of fiction and nonfiction books by local authors here. Uh, number two, you may need to fact check because not all of these books are going to highlight are perfect, whether that be grammatical errors or questionable research. It doesn't hurt to cross-reference. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these books are older, so, you know, times have changed. We have the internet now. There's more <laughs> research to make sure things are right. And number three, buy local. Uh, there's a push to support your neighbors who own businesses, so let's support our local writers and our researchers. Let's jump into book number one. I'll we'll go back to that. So we, um, when I was doing a lot of research, I found George Sheets' book, and it's the setting, to the setting of the sun, the story of York. Um, this book is very comprehensive, includes a lot about York County history, but a fun fact is, did you know that the local youth leaders at the time requested that George not put in three stories of York County, three stories that they considered an embarrassment? They were the Confederate surrender in 1863, did not want to talk about that. They also did not want to talk about the Hex murder of 1928. And then finally, which we think is really interesting, is they didn't want to talk about um, William Goodridge and his, his story in the early 1800 New York County because of a scandal that involved his son, which later turned out to be debunked. Right. Now, when he was going through this and he was thinking, do I include this in the book? Um, he ended up doing it anyway. He included them, so he didn't really listen. Um, so these three stories are in the book, which we're pretty proud of him for that. Yeah, and like we said, um, they were perceived as embarrassing by the community. Uh, the surrender brought national criticism on New York County. Goodridge's story included a trumped-up rape conviction and sentenced in New York County court against his oldest son that required an act of his governor to mitigate. And then the Hex story is a murder involving perceived witchcraft and touching on issues of class and also drew negative international attention. Um, so just things that York Countyans didn't necessarily want to be associated with. Yeah. And there's other reasons behind their exclusion as well. Um, when the Confederates invade, invasion, and when you think about William Goodridge, they both involve race. And frankly, race can be an uncomfortable topic. We don't always want to talk about it. Um, but we think that a community that suppresses the achievement of William Goodridge is really missing out on an important part of York County and a part of its history because he was a successful businessman and an operator of the, of the Underground Railroad. Right, and things started changing um, during York's Civil War and Goodridge's studies in uh, 1987 and 1988 and then accelerated in 1999. First, Sheets helped lead the installation of a blue and gold state marker in front of Goodrich's former residence at 123 East Philadelphia Street in 1987, and that provided a high-profile acknowledgement of Goodrich's life and times. And then we have a list of events in the 1980s and 1990s that finally recognized York's role in the Civil War. Yeah. Yeah, so kudos to George Sheets. Yeah, finally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving forward, book number two. Uh, we couldn't miss Scott My Mingus. personal favorite. <laughs> so Scott Mingus wrote this book. It's Guiding Lights, Underground Railroad Conductors in York County, Pennsylvania, and he profiles 25 local uh, conductors of the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really a, the most comprehensive list that we have of these conductors. Um, here is a quick snapshot of just, again, 25 profiles, and here are just five on the screen. So this barely even touches on the surface. Um, after he wrote, or before he wrote this book, he also wrote another book called The Ground Swallowed Them Up. And this is actually one of my favorites. Um, he published this in 2016 because it takes a much deeper dive into the people and their quest for liberty. Right, so we're going to share some highlights from the book. So Freedom Seekers set out on foot to cross the Mason-Dixon line after traveling through Maryland. 
And you'd think that they would be safe when crossing the symbolic line of slavery to freedom, but they weren't. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act meant that escapees fleeing into York County could still be kidnapped. And dangerous slave catchers roamed the place, so freedom seekers relied on the brave men and women to shelter them and conceal them on their way through the treacherous countryside. And it wasn't until they crossed the Susquehanna River that they could actually breathe a sigh of relief. If you want to hear more about Scott, Dami and I interviewed him, um, I guess going on two years ago now? Yeah, just about two years ago. Yeah. It's been a while. Um, and he just is, is the uh, Civil War expert, so we encourage you to go watch that video and also attend a lot of his conferences uh, or presentation that he puts on. Now, part of this we want to we want to emphasize is that um, Scott took the time to write these books, but they also his work has been amplified because um, Brian Wade he has um, a documentary that he put on that's called the Keystone Oral Histories, and he was thinking about creating a curriculum for schools that went through the Underground Railroad. Well, I was a high school history teacher for ten years, and so he contacted me and said, "Jamie, will you think about writing a curriculum that we can put into schools about?" York's role in the Underground Railroad. Well, guess where I went for my resources? Scott's books. So this is what I used. So in a way, Scott's books have um, are going to impact hundreds, if not thousands, of kids because we were able to take his content and make it into digestible different lessons for the kids. Um, so here are just some of the examples of the lessons. You can kind of get a little idea. No, that's, that's what it sounds like, yeah. I, I didn't want to give everything away. He, yeah. <laughs> he charges for the curriculum, so legally I actually can show you everything. Yeah. Uh, just gives you a quick snapshot of the different worksheets that you can use. If you're a teacher watching this, you should purchase the curriculum because it's super great. <laughs> yeah, so um, leading into the third book, um, it's largely a love story. It's called Yellow Soap by Catherine Haviland Taylor, and it traces the life of a young man named Hargraves Bradley. And Taylor was an author and an artist from York who published the fiction novel in 1920 and loosely based the setting on York. So a book from 1920, it's still relevant today. Yeah, yeah. Um, she, in her book, so she lived in York County, and this book is supposed to take place in York County. She doesn't really mention, though, York a lot. And, um, it's not like there's a lot of street names right. or, like, the Cadors really isn't mentioned. And I think that a part of this was is she just talks about, like, Main Street. It's a, it's a broad yeah. representation for universal readers. If they're reading it, they can relate to it better, which I think is interesting. But she does talk about buying a train ticket to Harrisburg or traveling up to Enola. That's cool. Here are some of the major themes that are in her book. Um, and so it's not just a fly by the seat of your pants kind of like fluffy book. It's actually mm -hmm. a pretty decent book that goes into a lot of different details. Yeah, so Delia Hargrave's mother became pregnant out of wedlock, and she raises her son on her own, uh, complete with the 1900s shaming that came along with that for the time. And the townspeople constantly reminded her of her transgression by subtle, subtle side glances to outright denying her employment. Yeah. Um, the main character has a hard time finding a job. So she eventually does find a job as a maid and a dishwasher for a very wealthy family. And Delia sometimes welcomes her son Hargraves to join her. And while he's there, he, he's in poverty, so he witnesses how the other half lives and what it's like to be wealthy. And um, he says later that the smell of the yellow soap from his mother's wash would overwhelm him. So you know that olfactory senses are connected to our memory. So later, as an adult, it's called yellow soap because the smell would haunt him because it was reminding him of what it was like to live with nothing. Yeah, and that's a really powerful you know, theme throughout the book, yeah. and naming the book Yellow Soap because of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Taylor took complex American themes like poverty and framed them in a storyline. She made it clear that the wealthy had their place and the poor had theirs, and they rarely mingled together. Santa Claus only visited places where the front steps were stone, Taylor mm -hmm. wrote. Yeah, mm -hmm. she talks so about the steps. Yeah. Yep. So for some, um, generational poverty can hold them back. It's a very difficult cycle to break. However, Taylor wanted her 1920s readers to know that there was hope. She was a writer, so you can guess what she was going to say, was the hope out of it, education and reading and writing. Um, but I thought this was really interesting. So she promoted education as a way to get out of poverty, but she problematizes it. Because at one point, her son says to her, why does she, why does she let me learn to read and see what other kinds of life are like when I got to live in an alley and live like a hog? <laughs> Frederick Douglass said the same thing right. um, when he was born into slavery he described in his book um, his autobiography about how when he learned how to read that he was stuck in poverty how it was just uh, kind of the glass ceiling the concept mm -hmm. of you can see but you can't reach it 
Right, that's really hard. Mm -hmm. So if you want to buy that book, you can actually purchase it on Amazon. Yep. So it's still in print today. I'll say that real quick. Um, I recently tried to refine it on Amazon. And oh, is it not a So I couldn't available? find it. However, I went back to my cart from 2019. Okay. And I found it and I clicked on it and there it was available. So if you want to buy it, let me know. I can send you the link. It takes some sleuthing. It's public domain now. So I guess no one's making money off of it. So Amazon puts it to the file. Yeah, and I buy a lot of books online. So like shout out to like Abe books or thrift books. Yeah. You might be able to find it in other places. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of interesting because have you ever wanted to unlearn something or is reading more of like an escape for you or... You're like, why do you read? Yeah, yeah. Because you're all here because you're interested in your county or reading or writing. You're in a library. So. <laughs> <laughs> like I know for me at night, I, I usually spend my dream, my dream night. I'm in my 30s, but it seems like I'm in my 80s. <laughs> bed for my son, 8:30. In bed myself, 8:45. I do my journaling every night. I do my Spanish every night, and I and I like to read. Lights off by 9:30. <laughs> <laughs> we have known for a while you turn into a pumpkin by night. I do. <laughs> you know, that. True. <laughs> well, and my mom and I, we always go to bed at 10 o'clock. It's, you know, oh. we're early birds too, but I'm always reading. I also practice Italian right before you yes. sleep. And yep. then, yeah, I'm always reading a new book or um, I started a book club at work and I actually have a running PDF of all of the books like I've ever read. Oh my gosh. And I, yeah, it's it's huge, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I send it out to all the court staff, whether they want it or not. <laughs> like every month, it's updated, and sometimes you get a reply. Sometimes I know they're just like delete. But... <laughs> There's that librarian again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we want to celebrate all these local efforts to tell these untold stories of Catherine Haviland Taylor. Um, she wrote more than 20 books, and some of them turned into movies and screenplays. Mm. So she really had an impact, and, and yeah. um, she lived in York County for a while. Not all books have been so inclusive. Um, George Powell wrote this book in, uh, this is a reprint, but he wrote this in 1907. And it is very informative. It includes 55 different profiles of significant history makers in York County. Um, they're all white men. And we're not going to judge you for that. Times were different. It was 100 years ago. But we do like that we're, we are seeing uh, more diverse voices creeping up. Right. And this contrasts with the past practice of studying history locally and nationally that trended to research and write uh, from a top-down perspective. And that resulted in incomplete and inaccurate histories. So you can check out all of these books that reverse to that trend. And we have those listed for you. And we can't cover every single book, so you can check out Witnessing York, which is Jamie and Jim's website, uh, for more on women's history, black history, and Latino history. Um, but there's one book that covers a whole lot of ground, and that's book number four. Book number four, which is... <clears throat> Couldn't talk about local history without Jim McClure. So we actually had trouble. We had to be like, all right, Jim, which one of your books are we going to talk about? He's too humble. Because <laughs> there's so many. We could, we could do a whole presentation just on, on Jim McClure's work. Um, so this is never to be forgotten. And when I was doing my doctoral research, this became invaluable because you can flip through it. And what he does is he does um, a lot of various articles from York County history. And it's largely comprehensive. I mean, it goes the whole way from the 1300s, I think Native Americans, the whole way up to current day. Um, so I, I found this very useful to look at the highs and lows of York County history. Your copy has survived better than mine has. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I don't even think mine's like bound anymore. <laughs> Jim, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here for a quick second. When you see your books with highlights, does that make you cringe, or does that make you be like, okay, someone's reading it? Mainly cringe. <laughs> <laughs> As a librarian, that's like a sin right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, though. Uh, so Jim was published in 1999 as part of the 250th anniversary of the county, and he's currently working on the 25th anniversary update edition with more stories, so go Jim. And it spans the whole length of time between 1300 to the date of publication. So we're going to show you a headline here of a York man caught on Booth's scheme. Ned Spangler, a York County native, held John Wilkes Booth's horse while he assassinated Abraham Lincoln, and he was caught and served time in prison. So not the best no. York County connection, no. but... This is just like a taste. If yeah. you purchase this book, um, what you'll find. So here's another one that caught my attention. 
husband's ads. <laughs> it was in 1837, um, and when women would decide to leave their husbands, some husbands would take out ads uh, warning the public, like brochures and innkeepers, that their wives were on the loose because women were going and buying things on credit, and then their husbands were getting this big bill, and so they wanted to warn people, don't let my wife, you know, take, buy groceries. <laughs> it's like today's Facebook drama. <laughs> it is, but there's no commenting, I guess. That's true. <laughs> so, um, he also included a lot of stories that are just fun or interesting. So, like balloonists capti uh, captivate public when George Eliot flew over Hanover in his hot air balloon. So, that's pretty cool. And he also threw cats and dogs and parachutes from the balloon, which I don't agree with, because I have a cat and a dog at home, and they can't fly. So, uh, yeah, not cool. But uh, if you want to read more about it, it's available on Amazon. Yeah. And Jim donates the proceeds to the History Center, too. Um, when I was reading that and hearing about the cats and dogs, I was thinking about you. Yeah, you're... Uh, so Dami sends Otto a holiday card for every holiday. Yeah, they do. Aww. For every holiday we get from Aunt Dami. Um, and it's so sweet because each one has a little stamp of the paw prints of her cats and dogs. <laughs> yeah. It's very cute. Yep, if you ever received snail mail from me, Peanut and Puddin will sign, sign it. <laughs> <laughs> so one tip that we want to um, just kind of let you in on with our reading styles is you really don't have to commit to an entire book to start reading. Um, like this book, for example, especially like big books, it can seem daunting and you might not even want to pick it up, but really you can open it up and just start skimming through it. Um, for example, one of my good friends, John Naylor, he volunteers for the river and does a lot of cleanup, uh, volunteers for the Lower Susquehanna Reading, uh, our Lower Susquehanna River Association. And he told me that the Bible of books was um, Susan Stranahan's book called Susquehanna River of Dreams. And so, and it was also a part of um, your County History Center's book club called Bookmark. So I was like, oh, I'll participate and join in. And when I started, the intro was like so good. Like mm -hmm. intros, that's where your money has to be. Because if people don't like the intro, they're going to set it down. But then when I started getting into chapter one, it was like, I'm sorry, Jerry Jones, but it was about geology. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I like rocks, but I got to like the bottom of a page. And have you ever read something and you're like, I have no idea what I just read? Right, um, and so I thought I, this isn't for a grade. I'm not going to have a test. My teacher isn't watching me, so I skipped it. And I was like, I'm not reading this chapter. And instead, I had like chapter three, which was on logging, and chapter seven, which was on agriculture. And so I just kind of jumped around, and I ultimately probably only read about half of the book, but yeah. that's okay. I still really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think the last time I really skimmed a book, um, I worked for the federal court system as a law librarian, and when I got hired, I didn't know anything about the law. You know, I had the library side down, but to help with research, you have to know something about the mm -hmm. law. So they gave me these um, primer books that told you sort of like the basic paralegal sort of things mm -hmm. you had to know, mm -hmm. and I did my best, but they're dry and I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, so, you know, after a while skimming, yeah. and you know, I referenced back and forth, but yeah, couldn't couldn't read it word for word through the whole thing. Yeah, and that's okay. We're adults. You can yeah. skim now. You don't have to read every single page. <laughs> that's true. Now, one thing though that you can't skim is when you're the author of your own book. <laughs> so of course, uh, sorry guys, we're gonna do plugs for our own book came tonight. So, so you are gonna hear a little about, bit about this. Um, so I wrote my dissertation on agriculture, and so I got to know the Rex Ross really well, and they were down in the Windsor area. And um, Jim Rex Ross called me and said that his dad Ken was dying of cancer. And he said, we don't want to lose his stories. And so um, he got me to go up there, and we did six different interviews from uh, March to June of 2022. And we would talk in our work office. We would go out and walk around in the fields. We would go on truck rides. And I was able to document his stories. And there are 25 kind of mini chapters about what farm life is like. And I really enjoyed it because it's more of an ethnography. So I'm, I'm very happy to have read that. Yeah, and in it, uh, chapter 15 highlights some really fun uh, farm living stories that I think a lot of people can relate to growing up in York County and probably growing up on a farm or near a farm. So chapter 15, it's called Mouse in Your Pants, <laughs> Rats, Snakes, and Other Creepy Crawlers. So he tells a story about being surprised by rats, and he said, we load corn to take to Lancaster, emptying the cribs, and we might not even know that there's a rat in that crib. And the stun of... Um, 
the stun of a defensive rat didn't stop Ken from finishing the job, and he said, believe me, he's going to come out one way or the other. Uh, so the last time there was a mouse in our house, my mom picked up peanut and pudding and ran and hid, and it was my job to get the mouse out of the house. So hey, all. I can feel Ken on this one. <laughs> um, happy mustard snakes. Yeah, so there was also a baby snake in our house one winter, Aww. and Puddin saw it. It was like a little garter snake, yeah. and Puddin's not really a hunter. She just alerts you to it, and Mom picked up Peanut under one arm and Puddin <laughs> under the other and locked herself and the kids in the bathroom, and I got one of those grabbers that they give you like if you're in like rehab at the hospital, <laughs> and I picked it up, and I took it outside. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I can relate to Ken. I understand the creepy crawlers and the rats. Um, Ken has a great story about his brother because Ken also never really mastered the idea. I feel like you're a snake charmer now, though. I, I, need I, you to. I mean, I don't want to claim that because I feel like then they're going to come to me and I'm going to have to <laughs> like bad juju. Yeah. Um, but he talks about how Donald, his one brother, would be really good at like grabbing the head and grabbing the tail and then they would put it um, in the corn crib because then mm -hmm. it would catch the mice. Nice. And so they like the idea of of recycling yeah. nature instead of just killing it. Mm -hmm. And he said, though, um, he said, I never mastered that. And he's like, he never got into having <laughs> snakes. It's not for everybody. Yeah. But the mice didn't bother Ken at all, and here's one of his mouse stories. So I went in the house, in my kitchen, and I always took off my boots on the porch, and I went in and I felt this, pointing to his right pants pocket. A mouse crawled up my pants leg, and I slapped that thing really good when I found out it was a mouse. It fell out, and Sue said, you had a mouse in your pants, and you didn't even know it. Oh. <laughs> and that was all about two years ago. <laughs> it's cute. Yeah. Um, so in the course of the um, few months that I interviewed Ken, um, there was a distinct um, declining in his memory, and he ended up passing back in December. Um, uh -oh. So I'm very ha happy to have um, written about his life and... Um, um, you know, because his descendants won't know him, you know, right. I think about the kids like Otto won't know his great grandparents, my son, and that, and that makes me sad. So the idea that uh, his future lineage might not know him, but they can read about him. And I named the book um, as he tells it because I used a lot of personal quotes um, because I wanted to come from him. It just sounds so much better too. that like that York County farmer dialect. It just it sounds so much better. So. Um, so I tried to capture his voice. So you guys are here tonight to hear these stories. So we're hoping another takeaway for you is that when you read these books, um, that you remember them, but you also like continue to tell the stories because they shouldn't just live in books. They shouldn't just be in the library. They should be a part of our culture and we should be talking about it, which is why we're here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And this is available on Amazon. Jamie's not going to try and sell her own book. <laughs> I'll sell it for her. <laughs> Brings us to another tip, though. Yeah, so you should also have an editor anytime you're writing your own book. Um, I know when I wrote, I have three different books out on Amazon, and Jim was great with, hey, like, do you want me to look at it? He said he would look at it. His son Joe would look at it. Um, and when I wrote my last book, I actually got uh, Corey Van Brookhoven from um, Lancaster. He works at the Lidditz Museum. And he was a great editor, and he went through because when you're writing your own piece, you can look at it until, you know, your eyes go crossed, yeah. and you'll miss tons of mistakes. And I think it's just you're blinded by your own work. Yeah, and, um, you know, just silly little things like typos, something spelled wrong, or you're using the wrong punctuation, and you just don't know. And I can't tell you how many times I've... Uh, read books by, like, I'll call them indie authors, people that self-publish or have really small publishing gigs. Um, and you'll just find, like, that one little mistake, but it's so glaring to I you. I know! Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and you said you, you've experienced that, where you've seen... Uh, there are, I was kind of so far, six mistakes in my book. <laughs> because, guys, I didn't mean this to, like, be sold to the public. Like, I wasn't expecting to sell this. It was for the family. And oh. so I got my amazing husband to read it. And he's awesome, but, like, he's not an editor, you know? And so um, it was Jim that said, why is this just going to be for the family? Like, you should put it out to the world. You should sell it. And I'm like, well, okay. And just put it out. And then my family was like, you know, like, you spelled whipped wrong. You spelled all these things hey, wrong. It could be. Hey, it's, it's York County. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, my first cookbook, I spelled a woman's name wrong. She, like, gave me the recipe. And she's like, my name's not uh, Laura. It's Lana or something. Oh. And I was like, no, I'm so sorry. 
hard. It was like I got your entire name wrong. <laughs> Speaking of your book, so Dami wrote an amazing book, um, and it is called Then and Now, A Pictorial View of a Changing Town, and it shows how Newbury Town has changed over time with photographs. Yeah, thank you, Jamie, for bringing that up. Um, yeah, so I grew up in Newburytown, and I still live there. I actually live in the house that my grandma had built in um, 1964, and it was my parents' house, and now my mom and I live there together. So, you know, three generations growing up in one house, and my grandpa and his family grew up across from Newbury Elementary School, mm. right in the heart of Newburytown. Um, so Newburytown has just changed so much. I mean, even just mentioning Newbury Elementary School, um, that used to be just someone's farm field and then you know the school was built um, and then there was a bar next to it that my great grandma got their liquor license she tried to take that away from them <laughs> well I mean it's a bar next to an elementary school um, but and now that's a car lot you know and it's just the town has changed so much so um, through my preserving the history of Newberry town group I went through and I just solicited hey share your family photos um, you know show me how the town has changed in your lifetime mm -hmm. So it's basically just, this is what it used to look like, and this is what it looks like now. And Dami and I aren't like anti-change people, right? Like, right. I happen to love the Dunkin' Donuts that's now oh. in Newberry Town. <laughs> that is a controversial stance. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> as, as long as development is done in a way that is, you know, we're thinking about green spaces, and, sure. and is, but we still need them, our coffees, and we still need places to live. But just It in, could be worse. It could be. Just in the three years I've lived there, I've seen a lot of changes. Yeah, we have. And, yeah, we can't... Um, shut down change we sort of have to live with it and work with it and Jamie and I are proponents of using existing buildings and using existing spaces and changing them into things so you know like that bar it turned into there's a car lot there now it's not just you know like a broken down empty space and um Right next to my grandpa's house, they took an empty lot, and there's a food truck there now. That's cool. So, you know, and people love that food truck. Shout out to Taco Sanchez. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he has, like, lines around the food truck every day for lunch. So, you know, people are using it, and they're utilizing the town, mm -hmm. and... People are buying Dunkin' Donuts, so they can say they hate it. I heard in your month. voice. I heard that. Um, you had a little bit of a hint in your voice. Are you anti Dunkin' Donuts? Um, no, but I like. Did you hear that pause? She's anti Dunkin' Donuts. I really like McDonald's um, iced coffee, <laughs> and I really like the cappuccinos from Maple Donuts. So maybe oh. like Dunkin' would be like third or fourth. Okay. Part of my list. So when I messaged you when you were sick last week and said, "Hey, I'm stopping at Dunkin'. What can I get you?" She was like. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I, you were a snob. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I was really sick, you guys. It's not my fault. Um, but I would have drank it. <laughs> Give me some of your resources. Yeah. So um, I do a lot of genealogical resources or uh, research. So um, I like to share the resources that I use. Family Search is free. Um, it's run by the Mormon Church, and the Mormons, if you don't know, are our biggest genealogical researchers in the world, really. Um, and then Ancestry.com basically has everything that Family Search does, but it's behind a paywall, so they have more. You can get international um, resources on there. Ancestor Tracks, the York History Center. If you haven't utilized the archives in the library at the York History Center, please do, because you're missing out. Um, a lot of local authors have their books there in the archives or in the, uh, the, um, library. the library or just for sale. Um, so that's great. And then here at the Redland Community Library, or any York County Library for that fact, um, Martin Library has a huge archive um, that you can go through. So today, actually, Karen, the uh, librarian here at Redland, has an entire table out in the lobby that is focusing on York County authors like ourselves, like Jim, Scott yeah. Mingus. So she pulled a lot of books. So before you leave tonight, you know, go check those out, and you can check them out and take them home with you. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have so many local resources that I think people are a little blinded to it. They yeah. think they have to go on Google and really look for these out there resources mm -hmm. when just going to your local library is going to help you get 99% of the stuff that you want. And it doesn't cost anything. No, it's totally free. Get your library card if you haven't already. That's what I, I came in and a uh, librarian was like, does Adam yeah. have his library card? And I was like, no. He's about to. And she was like, well, he's not leaving with that one. So yay. <laughs> you can get a library card the day you're born. <laughs> so that was the six um, main books that we wanted to focus on. So now we're going to do a lightning round of some books that we can't not talk about. And one of the first ones is Armand Gladfelder's The Flowering of the Cadoras Palatinate. Um, this is an excellent book when you want to look at um, local geographies, kind of what Dami did with her preserving the history of Newburytown. This goes from 1838 the whole way to 1988, and he talks a lot about um, local politics, state events, national events, movements like the environmental movement. 
um, what World War II was like in New York County, but he also talks about how culture changed. So there's this really interesting segment in here about when the railroad came through York County and how people then, because the railroad started getting exposed to all these different ideas, because people were moving. So I thought that was really cool looking at culture shift. And then, of course, he has one of my favorite quotes ever written in a book about York County. It's in the early 1900s. And he said, <clears throat> now mind you, I'm, I love York County, right? I love York County. But he said, he was talking about how York County was a little backwards. He said, the average farm woman still stood up to urinate. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the men snapped the mucus from their nose with thumb and forefinger. Oh, I know. And I'm like, oh, like that's a, there's a, like, that's a little rough, but like, I know, there's a little part of the game. I think of the ladies. And I saw everyone's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds about right. Um, this, I did not get on Amazon. Um, this was actually a pretty expensive book. Um, I, I do think it was about $100, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I had to find it on an extra um, website that um, for like, ex like rare books and you get the library but I had a hard time finding this um, Jim I did write in it so <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, did you see the small frown he made he's like Ugh. That's not a small frown. That's a big frown. Yeah. Um, that's going to be his little bobblehead that pops up on the screen. And she's going to be like, Jamie. I know. Um, and while I do love the book, um, Armand never discloses any um, sources that he used or his methodology. So if you're going to use it, fact check it. And, um, because I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that I use it more as a primary source because he didn't disclose where he got his information. And our next one is Lee Smallwood's book, York at 250. Do we have that to hold up? Mm -mm. No, okay, unfortunately. So that looked at York City at its 250th anniversary in 1991, and he wrote, A great history reflects the greatness of a people. It is their reputation chiseled in time to speak of why they are and what they are capable of. There is no future for a people who deny their past. If you don't know who you are as a people, then you don't know who you are as a person. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, it book. is. Another one of our favorites is uh, June Burke Lloyd. She wrote Faith and Family. This is all about um, York County Frochter and Top Shine. So what's really cool about her book is that she uses a lot of pictures. So it is beautifully done uh, with lots of credible research and lots of pictures of all of the wonderful Frochter that we have here in York. And if you don't know what Frochter is, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to go get the book. <laughs> Um, so she looks at a lot of local patterns and the importance of religion of the people, and she goes back on uh, many familial lines, um, and yeah, so it's a great book. It is, and we quote uh, June a lot in our research yeah. and our presentations. So. Yeah, she's awesome. She is. And then um, a best local level town book, River and Ridge. Um, so this one, do we have this to hold up? No, we don't have this one either. See, none of the books she chose for me to talk about. I can't believe that. Oh. I don't know this one. I can't have my Vanna White moment. So, um, as the title suggests, this book explores two large influences on Delta and Peach Bottom life. So, the Susquehanna is a fishery and its transportation assets with canal and ferry. And the 12-mile ridge from which Building Slate was quarried, most notable for a century after 1845 when the skilled Welsh quarrymen came to town. And we'll be going down there soon for another week. We one are, yeah. Soon. So... Stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> so another book about your accounting history is Hex by Arthur Lewis. The subtitle is A Spellbinding Account of Witchcraft and Murder in Pennsylvania. So when I was at York College for my undergrad in history and education, I wrote my senior thesis on the Hex murder of 1928. And so, of course, I got this book, and I went to the archives, and I was reading it. And as a naive 21-year-old, I took everything as fact. Later, when I went back and reread it, um, this book does have a – it's going to keep your attention. It is interesting. There are some truths about what happened with Limeyer and Raymar and Curry and what happened down in Raymar's Hollow. It's always also very problematic. He talks a lot about superstition and he demonizes people and it's also not 100% true. Um, this was written in the 1960s. So if you want to know the actual truth, get this book. Yeah, so if you want to learn the real truth, uh, you have to read Ross McGinnis's Trials of Hex, and he became a lawyer and a local expert on the topic, so <coughs> he thinks that is the factual account that we want you to yeah, go to. That's the book you get. Yeah. So we also have a lot of kids' books here in New York County, too. Yeah. Um, so I uh, was a teacher at Mount Hershey School, and I taught with Lisa Petropoli, and she's a co-founder of a um, publication company called Creo and Teeth, which means I believe in you in Spanish. 
And what she does is she has local students. Um, Ashlyn is from Billsburg, and she gets them to write books. One of our favorites is Dante El Elefante, and when you read it, it has both the English and the Spanish. So these go all around the world. They are international books because they're trying to promote literacy. She's trying to promote students. She's trying to help people learn both Spanish and English. Um, so shout out to Lisa. Uh, I, I think this is really cool. And she wrote many different books. She wrote her own book on kindness. So this is just a, a, a tip of the iceberg. Super cool. And then we have Tavon and Tiana Parker. What do you <laughs> mean? Thank you. <laughs> what do you mean? A book about a curious little girl who always asks, what do you mean? And it's a conversation between a father and his daughter who is searching for answers. Never be afraid to ask a question when you're confused, it reads, which I think is a great message. Yeah. yeah. This is a very cute book. Um... One of my like local heroes is Earl Schaefer. So yeah. Earl Schaefer was the first person to walk the entire <coughs> AT um, and the Appalachian Trail. And he did it after World War II because he wanted to walk off the war. So for him, it was meditative um, because there is a high chance that he had PTSD. So there is a great book called 2,000 Miles to Happiness, Earl Schaefer and the First Through Hike of the Appalachian Trail by Andrea Shapiro. Um, I bought this down at the Appalachian Store Trail down over in Pine Grove Furnace area, but it is very beautifully designed and very written. Nice, yes. um, so I think it's kind of cool that there's like a York County guy and then they turned it into a book. And then you just mentioned Earl Schaefer. Yep. So we're going to talk about Silas Chamberlain, who wrote this book. So he's going to be with us in a few minutes for our extra episode. We're going to interview him. And the name of the book is On the Trail, A History of American Hiking. And I read this before I even knew Silas. Oh, really? Yeah, so that was cool. Uh, but yeah, so again, a York County native. Yeah. And someone we're going to be talking to in a little bit on our extra episode. Stay tuned for that. So one of our final tips then for tonight is, um, this can seem really overwhelming. There are so many different books that you can choose from. A lot. Um, but really, just start reading the history stories as they arise. Um, in local newspapers, Jim writes a column every week still, and also there's a lot of local history blogs. So if you read one by Scott Mangus, I'm one of them, Stephen Smith, June Lloyd, and John Concilio, John Concilio they are all um, accredited and do their fact-checking. So your blog is a good source. And don't count out social media. I know people are weary about Facebook, but there's a lot of good resources on there. So Retro York, which is run by Jim. I run Preserving the History of Newburytown. And then there's uh, geographical groups, uh, Friends of the Doris Valley and Old Hanover. And in particular, you're going to search uh, for past posts on the topic. So community members have asked and answered uh, about certain topics. So if you just type in the title that you're looking for or the topic you're looking for, you're going to see discussions. And you can read the archived material on the York County History Center's website. For example, about a dozen past issues of the Journal of York County Heritage are on there. And there are virtual tours and databases of the murals of York and World War II's York Plan. And they're all on the website for you to read. All online. Yeah. So now we're wrapping up here, we hope that you walk away with these three takeaways. Yes. One is that your next read is right here in York County yeah. um, because there's so many different books and authors are right here. Um, I also, though, I encourage you to fact check because, like, as I told you, I may have my PhD, but I spell things wrong sometimes. <laughs> so uh, don't hope I should have paid for an editor or just asked one of my friends to do it. Hey, your but... PhD was not in spelling. I know, so. I know. I don't know why I can't spell. We did um, a presentation a couple weeks ago, and um, the word defense was up Yeah, there? you can't read either. <laughs> De What's that word? Um, so I had a little bit of a brain fart, but it doesn't cross-reference. And then finally, um, buy local, support yeah. our local readers and writers, um, because they're your neighbors. Yeah, and like we uh, mentioned earlier, we have another episode coming up on March 28th, and it's open to the public at Logos Academy, and it'll be on the Cadoris and the waterways through York County, and we're going to be interviewing Mayor Helfrich, and he's going to join us for the extra interview part. Um, but stay tuned, because we'll be back in like five minutes mm -hmm. with Silas Chamberlain. So thank you guys.